What is paganism? What is Wicca? Their belief systems, traditions, and rituals? Seen here, a Maypole ritual honoring the Sabbath or Holy Day of Beltane, marking the longest day of the year. Who are some of paganism and Wicca's contemporary adherents, and what draws them to these spiritual paths? Welcome to Exploring Paganism. In this edition, you'll learn more about the structure of the ritual practice, about the Beltane observance, and more about ritual items used in the Willow Dragonstone pagan community and coven. It is common for pagans to adopt a magic name, one chosen for ritual purposes. Chinook Jar is Gaelic for Oaken Fox. So for most rituals, and um, even for larger rituals and open Sabbaths that are open to the public, the actual ritual construction of it typically stays about the same. The, um, while the, the purpose of it and the actual working that we do in it may differ from, from ritual to ritual, the core of it is, is pretty much standard throughout. And it's basically a matter of um, uh, the way we work it is whoever is leading the ritual, whether high priest or high priestess, is going to cast a circle, which is basically um, creating a sacred space where a lot of religions have churches and temples to be able to go and celebrate. We build ours wherever we are. So that's essentially all that uh, casting a circle is, is creating um, energetically uh, a sacred space that's, you know, kind of that buffer between the mundane and spiritual. After that, it's a matter of calling in uh, the quarters, which is tied into elements and directions. This is also um, goes deeper into uh, uh, the embodiment of different parts of the physical self, whether it's intellect or emotion, passion, um, things like that. And it's basically uh, a matter of symbolism and bringing in all those different parts of ourselves to say, you know, kind of this is all part of who we are and to openly welcome your complete self into the circle. A woman who goes by the ritual name Selkit Brigid chooses to remain off camera, as do those who feel they must remain in what's called the broom closet to avoid discrimination or worse. I love the beauty of the pagan religion, the goddess and, and the god, and it's what we, it's the attributes of the god and goddess that we choose our names from. Um, and also when we are in circle, there are certain goddesses or gods that are used during the building of the circle, and each one of those represents something. So it's not that we have multi-gods, it's just that we believe in the duality of mother nature, or of nature, male and female, and then we have the many attributes of the Lord and Lady or the God and Goddess. So it's, it's like I said, it's not that we are, uh, I don't know what the word is, but we don't believe in many gods, we believe in the attributes of the God and Goddess or the, or the duality of nature. By the energy of the highest mountain. Sarah Neal performs ritual as a high priestess. She is CEO of Willow Dragonstone. I was tagged by Freya um, several years ago. And so I have been a priestess of Freya for about five years now, openly. I kept searching, I kept trying out different pantheons. Like there was a while I was delving into the Native American and shamanistic aspects. I delved into the Greek mythology because I grew up loving Greek mythology. I tried to fit into the Celtic because it almost felt right, but it was like the shoe was just a little too tight, didn't quite fit well. And Dee and I were challenging each other on, um, not challenging, but holding each other accountable. We were doing a project where each month we would study, we would pick a goddess and we would focus on that goddess for a month, just the two of us, um, just to kind of help get a connection. And the second one I chose, I was looking through and I felt a pull to study a goddess of beauty and of love and kept pulling and pulling and I found Freya and I found the fierceness of Freya with her um, warrior spirit and her Valkyries and having the first choice among the dead on the battlefield before Odin and just her strength and her com comfort in who she is sexually and as a woman and as a powerful woman or goddess and that was it. Everything just clicked together like a puzzle piece. And that's when I realized that that's exactly where I was supposed to be. And since then I haven't 
looked back. Katie Thackery is a Willow Dragonstone member. I don't know if there's, you know, a particular blessing or anything that stands out to me. I will say that um, one of the things that I like most about our rituals and how we um, structure them, which is, uh, from what I understand, very different from most traditional um, places, is that we are allowed to acknowledge whatever divinity calls to us. And I mentioned before that there's no one in particular that I just adhere to, but that does allow me the flexibility to, to call on whatever divinity I hear from at the time or whatever divinity I identify with at the time. So, you know, if I'm going through a period of my life where I need help with, I don't know, finances or uh, fertility or, you know, whatever plethora of things, I can summon that deity and say, okay, you know, Morgan, you, you preside over most of the Celtic rituals. Um, I acknowledge you in this ritual or um, whatever the case may be. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, I don't know that there's anything in particular, but just the freedom to acknowledge whatever form of divinity everybody wants to is to me a very liberating thing. After that, there's, or depending on who's leading it and how they're leading it, before or after that, you'll have purification. This can be done any number of ways through commonly used as uh, smudging with white sage that comes from um, most of what the process that we use today comes from uh, Native American traditions. Um, you may use uh, bells to try and push out energy. Um, we've gone all the way out to... Uh, using uh, links of pine, um, actual pine needles, and uh, spurging people, basically uh, dipping the pines into um, purified water and using that and actually using the physical water to cleanse. Tony Crabtree is a co-founder of Willow Dragonstone. Well, that's part of every ritual. We, we cleanse people's uh, aura and help ground and center them by doing that. Uh, that's probably one of my strengths actually now that you mention it is is grounding and helping other people uh, find their center of balance. Um, if the name of our community is Willow Dragonstone. I don't know if, uh, the word Dragonstone is the is it came from Dia and I, my wife and I. And on our wedding cake, she wrote a poem and said, uh, she is the dragon and, and you are the stone. It's because she was all up here flying around and I was down here keeping her grounded. And this is basically uh, a process of divulging, your, divulging yourself of the... Um, negative things that happen to us throughout, you know, our day-to-day -day lives. Everybody has those stressors and those, you know, work issues and whether it's, you know, stuff at home or dealing with family and all of that. All of that is energy that we carry with us wherever we go. And the act of the purification is basically the symbolism of removing ourselves from that and saying, okay, for, for this amount of time, we're going to take that and push it over here. And we're going to let it stay over here so that we can focus on what we need to and have that good, clean energy flowing through. Um, and after that, it's pretty much a matter of ritual construction, whatever it's going to be for, for that particular time, um, whatever, if we do any actual magic for that ritual, whatever it's going to be. Um, and then it's basically the whole process working in reverse. We, you know, break it all down and, uh, you know, release quarters. Lydia Crabtree is also co-founder of Willow Dragonstone, a high priestess, author, and pagan rights advocate. The Beltane represents in, in uh, the pagan culture the marriage of the god and the goddess to fertilize the land. In this culture where we live, this is a time where we've just planted, I just planted my raised beds, many people have. And so the maypole back in that time was used as a way to symbolically have that marriage happen and fertilize the land. So they saw the energy of the maypole going into the land and fertilizing the fields. So that's part of what you saw today was the maypole. And that was the whole bit where I married my husband again and I came back pregnant because that's the whole symbolism behind the maypole itself. 
Then we also did the bale fire, and this was very common. They talked about that during ritual, as we normally do, but the bale fires were used to symbolize um, that burning fire in the land, that, that fertilization having happened, that uh, a metaphor for the actual act. And um, they would drive cattle between two bale fires for insecticide purposes. We know that some of the woods that were commonly used have those kind of properties, and so it was a good thing to do. They the about to send them up to their summer pastors, and so they want them to be all clean. And then, of course, there was a lot of wishing. Many groups who own a place, and Willow does not, um, will bury their bell fire into the ground. So the reason you saw us jumping a very small cauldron was because we don't own the property we're on, so we can't dig a hole. <laughs> a permanent hole that we can use um, and that makes it safer you can have the fire people jumping and it's and m m people are less likely to come to harm <laughs> when they do it this is probably the most misunderstood um, tool that you might associate with paganism and it's the cauldron this is a small one compared to others that my community has and i actually this is truth i went to the lodge um, <laughs> outlet and bought this lovely thing. It's a very cheap way to get your cauldron. Um, but the cauldron, as I mentioned before, is the womb of the mother. And then in Celtic mythology, there are all kinds of myths about the cauldron being used to, there was a cauldron of plenty in, in Celtic myths that fed everybody who came to it. Um, Brie has this whole thing where she's creating a stu soup for her son to make him the wisest of all people. It accidentally, get, it accidentally gets to drunk by the wrong person, <laughs> and he becomes the greatest bard ever known in Celtic mythology, known Taliesin. So, the use of this is many-fold. Um, I've used a, I've used a cauldron to do a foot washing um, of members of community to help them better walk their spiritual path. We've used cauldrons to burn. You can see this cauldron has ash in it. We've obviously burned something in here, usually a candle or a spell. Um, we've used it, I've used it to do stone soup, um, which is, of course, from the book, Stone Soup, where everybody comes in and they bring something and then you make a soup out of that, which is an excellent way to celebrate Mabin, the witch's Thanksgiving. Everybody puts in their harvest and then you have a soup. All of that for us is magic. There's nothing that isn't apart from our ability to affect it with energy and create some kind of positive experience for ourselves or those we love or the earth herself. Um, and so that's the cauldron. We talk about the cauldron of Caridwen um, in some of our famous liturgy. And um, it's the place where you go to get your wisdom, where you go to get your inspiration. Um, one of my favorite pagan songs is Three Drops. And it's talking specifically about the three drops of Caridwen's Cauldron. It's a great song. Throughout history, Wiccans and pagans have had to keep their ritual objects under wraps. Candace Apple is the owner of Phoenix and Dragon Bookstore, a resource for pagan and Wiccan ritual items in Sandy Springs outside of Atlanta. Wiccans, have Wiccans could have, have their, their altar in a sewing kit because very often people needed to use symbols. Even the tarot were symbols to hide the deeper meaning. It was just could be a, a deck of cards would have the symbols in them. And the um, strega, the Italian witches, could fold out their sewing kit and there'd be your altar cloth, would be the little pouch unfolded. And then there'd be an athame from the scissors for cutting and making the circle. And there'd be the needle, which would be a wand. And there would be a thimble, which would be the chalice. And there you have your altar. And uh, sometimes when people see athames, they're the sword object or the ritual object. It's like, oh, that's scary. What are they doing? Well, you always create a circle, and that's your sacred space. And I think that's maybe also what's different with pagans and witches. The sacred space can be outside in the woods. It doesn't have to have a church, uh, but they're really honoring all 
space is sacred. And But then when you make intent, you make that circle and you have your ceremony and then you, you let go of the circle and uh, close it. In the store, Opal the cat joins the tour of pagan and Wiccan tools and supplies. We have different varieties of witch balls. Uh, what are those used for? Well, it's so funny, it depends on which culture you're in. Some they're to scare away the witches and others to invite them in. <laughs> so if you want them to come visit, they invite in. <laughs> and then each of these that are sort of trees, so they have different intents for each kind. The traditional ones are to the left with the plain colors. People ask me about their crystals and they go, I have to cleanse it. How do I cleanse it? I said, well, some people like to put them in salt water, but don't put your porous ones in salt water. Some people like to put them in a running stream, but make sure they don't just float away. Uh, some people like to put them under moonlight. Some people like to put them under sunlight. My teacher taught me you can take your crystal or any object you want to bless and turn it away from you and use your breath. You always have your breath. Then if you want to instill your purpose in it, you turn it towards you and blow. So that's something we have with us all the time. And, um, and even when people are coming to purchase things, I'll tell them, yes, here's a lovely pendulum that can help you douse and tell you a yes and no answer and help you look at subtle energies, subtle answers that you know inside of you but haven't burbled up to the surface yet. And it may be $10 or $20 or $30, or you can go home and get a piece of string and tie it around a little bolt and just dangle it and use it. There's old traditions of uh, midwives checking for boy or girl with uh, a needle tied and putting it over the mother's stomach. That's dowsing. Uh, dowsing with dowsing rods or sticks for water. I mean, those are all old pro practices that have been used over the years. For me, it's very important to remember that these are just tools. And if people say, what does that crystal do? My basic response will be, it doesn't do anything. Or it just sits there until you pick it up, at which point it helps you focus your energy. My personal belief is that if we do prayer or magic or affirmations, any of those things that we put out to the universe, if we just get scattered and forget our focus, it takes the affirmation of the magic, but it also takes action. And so the focus of the tools are to help you stay conscious, help you stay aware, help you not drift into your self-sabotage, um, be mindful of what you're doing right then and there and the different colors the different scents all these are things that are ways that nature can help us stay focused lydia crabtree agrees everybody's always asking about wands and i've gotten some together here for you today um wands are used in much the same way that the athame is used um, and i've gathered a couple this one is a crystal gemstone um, and for us, this would be a, the sending point. It's called a double termi termina terminated crystal. And this would be the sending direction. And this would be the pulling direction. So if you're working healing on someone, you were pulling something out of them, you would use this end. So um, I have had this. I'll never forget. I got it. Uh, someone I met on the Internet when I first started my first year met me and then sent me a whole bunch of stuff and, and it was this and I've been using it ever since. Then just at, at Yule, I was given this. This is selenite. Selenite is often used for wands and it's another naturally occurring stone. And the interesting thing about selenite, if you think of um, fiber cable, which is little tubes pulled together to make one, that's kind of how selenite works. It's long slender tubes. Put them all together and you can um, it kind of amplifies the energy that you're sending through it. Yeah. Selenites are very com commonly used as wands, but they're very fragile. That's the biggest problem we have with them. This is a wand of one of my community brothers. And you can see it's just a simple turned wand. I don't even know what wood this is. I'm going to guess oak. Um, but it, again, it's a tool of focus. All you're doing is sending your energy through it, focusing to the point, much like you would see in a Harry Potter movie. 
and then you're using it to direct for a very specific purpose. Um, and this one's a really nice bin one that's been done, but they can also be as simple as, I found a stick. <laughs> I think it's totally possible to come across a stick and use a wand, and I'm gonna give you a reason why. I have a child. When he was four, he picked up some wands all the time. He could make the wind blow with them. Little children have that such natural affinity to the earth and to their energy. And so they use it in that way. So can you do it? Yes. Most pagans, though, will find a stick, treat the stick like, like uh, my, my coven brother did this one, and get it prepped, and then they'll charge it in ritual with their community. And then it will be consecrated and sacred and only used for that. You've seen me handle these wands, and you've also seen me handle the, uh, my husband's tool. Um, typically, though, once one's been consecrated, it's only touched by the practitioner. I sleep with my husband. I don't think he's going to care that I've been touching his athame. Um, and I was given permission to show these other wands. But typically, they get consecrated, and you use them, and, and nobody else is going to touch them or use them because that might interfere with the energy. We do a lot of divination in paganism, and tarot is often used. We have all kinds of different tarot decks that are used, um, so it's really not fair to show one when <laughs> there's so many out there. Um, and it's considered a divinatory discipline in and of itself. Divination is a big part of most pagan practice. It's used as a way to have a more in-depth and directed conversation with the divine, and it can also be used to help your fellow um, community members or even strangers connect with the divine as well and get specific answers about specific questions. I like to think of it as prayer with feedback. Um, and I think that way about most divination as well. Um, I mentioned geomancy when I talked about Harry Potter. That's a type of divination. The runes, many people are very familiar with those. Um, the runes are the alphabets that are used by the Norse traditions, um, by the Asatru, and that's a whole divinatory system. What most people don't know is the Celts also have um, a similar system called the Oum, and it's a series of lines intersected with each other, and they each have a specific meaning, and you can use those for divination as well. So divination has all kinds of different manifestations. We have people in our group who created their own. We, my favorite is the 10-sided dice and uh, a board that she created. It looks much like a Ouija board. And she, used the, she rolls the dice and, and sees where they land on her board in relation to the question. It's a whole system that she's come up with. So divination doesn't have to be one thing or another. It can be whatever is needed for the person who's going to use that tool. So there's books about all kinds of divination, whether it's numerology or tarot, cards of destiny, I Ching. Um, Norse has the runes. So again, handwriting, palmistry, different traditions, but most of them have some type of oracle process for Reading subtle energy, something that you know on some level but not, may not know consciously, and helping bringing that out. This is the wheel of the year we've discussed, right? And if we orient this with Yule at the top and start at Yule, you can see Samhain is here, and across from that is Beltane. When you have Samhain, the veil is thin, but that also means the veil is thin at Beltane. So you'll have a lot of pagan practitioners who will specifically work divination in those times because they're closest to the astral plane where divinity resides, right? So that has a lot to do with what some people do, but there are people who do divination every day. I know people who work with the runes and they pull a rune every day and at the end of the day to decide how that rune was played out during their day. So it becomes a whole system of discipline and focus and spiritual exploration that individuals will do. Individual expressions of the spiritual path also include acknowledging one's chosen god or goddess, as Sarah Neal explains. I have several pictures of her around my house. I keep one in the bathroom and frames, and um, then I have an altar for her downstairs that's separate from my family altar, because I have one for my family um, that's just kind of general, and then I have uh, one for her specifically. So, 
and that's where I put her offerings, is right there. So I try to keep her constant in my sight to help remind me um, of who I am, and I'm one of hers, and so that can be very powerful in of itself. I will offer her some wine or some champagne. Right now, she's going through a bottle of Chambord um, and strawberries. And you know, like if, if we're having a nice dinner, I might, you know, give some, put a little bit aside for her as well. Um, I did our traditional Southern traditional New Year's feast, New Year's Day feast, and I left her a little plate too. So you know, just to say, hey, I'm not forgetting you. I know you won't forget me. So there we go. So that's what we did. Every night we'll, we'll say um, just a blessing over dinner. Um, Lord and Lady, thank you for this food and all of our blessings. And so the, our children do that. It, it doesn't matter where we are. Our, our kids are not self-conscious about it at all. We could be in the middle of a busy restaurant. They'd be like, all right, here we go. And that's what we do. And then I've been saying uh, the same prayers over them since my oldest was the baby. So that's become a tradition there. So just even little daily things and our daily practices every day are um, part of spirituality as opposed to, I like to think of it, spirituality as opposed to religion. So um, that's what we do. And they have their own little altars in their rooms. And um, then sometimes they'll come, they were here at the last ritual, so they'll be here at Ostara as well. So they come on certain things with us and um, just try, I've, I've told them whatever speaks to your heart. It doesn't have to um, be what I believe. It doesn't have to be what anybody else believes. Just speak to your heart. Whatever speaks to your heart is what it is. The idea that we are all part of divine and divine is a part of us. So divine can come through us and speak and it doesn't matter if we have the highest Pumba uh, certification or ranking within su such and such coven, or if we're just a solitary practitioner who has just gone by the feels and so, and how they feel. Like the idea that divine can come into any of us because divine is a part of us and we are a part of divine. And so divine can speak to all of us. We just have to be quiet enough and still enough to listen.